Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. The snow crab population in the Bering Sea has all but disappeared in recent years, threatening the livelihoods of many Alaskans. It was just very poor fishing. We searched for miles and miles and miles and really didn't see anything. We'll look at research into what might have happened and discuss the effects of the collapse right now on Alaska Insight. Good evening. For decades, the crab fishery in Alaska has been a reliable business for vessel owners and crew, but in recent years, the effects of climate change and other ocean stressors have affected that reliability. Tonight, we'll learn about what may be in store for the future. But before we get to that discussion, we'll start off with some of the top stories from the week from Alaska Public Media's Collaborative Statewide News Network. In a pair of closed-door meetings with members of the Alaska Legislature on Tuesday, Governor Mike Dunleavy said he is prepared to introduce a statewide sales tax as part of a long-term budget plan for the state. The tax bill, if introduced, would be the latest in a series of tax proposals this session. There's another sales tax bill, an income tax, and two bills that would make changes to the state's oil tax structure. Details are still scarce on the governor's potential proposal, but with only a few weeks left in the session, any tax proposals in the legislature face an uphill battle in passing this year. The Anchorage Police Department announced Thursday it will move forward with getting body cameras on officers despite an ongoing dispute with the police officers' union over details of the department's proposed camera policy. This announcement comes two years after voters approved a $1.8 million tax levy to purchase the cameras, and the same week as a lawsuit from the nonprofit Alaska Black Caucus over the delay in implementing them. Anchorage Police Chief Michael Curl said Thursday the department's announcement had nothing to do with the timing of the lawsuit. And in a statement, Officers Union President Darrell Evans said they would continue working on the policy with the department. Alaska Black Caucus President Celeste Hodge Groudon said Thursday she's happy to see movement, but would also like to see a new timeline for implementation of the cameras. The Kenai Peninsula Borough will pay more than $225,000 to settle a harassment suit filed last fall against former borough mayor and former gubernatorial candidate Charlie Pierce. The announcement comes eight months after Pierce resigned and six months after his former assistant, Pamela Wastiel, sued him for repeated sexual harassment and sued the borough for failing to protect her. The borough assembly has been tight-lipped about most details of the suit, but in its meeting this week, they voted to make public the amounts that it and Pierce has settled to pay. In a statement sent by her lawyer Tuesday, Wastel said she was pleased by the settlement, but added there's not enough money in the world to go through what she had. You can find the full versions of these stories and many more on our website, alaskapublic.org, or by downloading the Alaska Public Media app on your phone. Now on to our discussion for this evening. The Bering Sea snow crab season was canceled this year after billions of crabs disappeared, devastating a commercial fishing industry worth $200 million and the livelihoods of those who depend on it. Now fishermen and researchers are working to figure out what happened and they think warming ocean water caused by climate change is the culprit. From KMXT and Kodiak, Kirsten Dobroth reports. The snow crab population in the Bering Sea off the western coast of Alaska has fluctuated for decades. An increase in young crabs back in 2018 led to optimism that fishing would rebound, but the hope was short-lived. It was just very poor fishing. We searched for miles and miles and miles and really didn't see anything. Gabriel Prout and his family own the Silver Spray in Kodiak, Alaska. He says it was obvious something was wrong the last few years. The Bering Sea fishing grounds are usually covered in sea ice in the winter, but there wasn't much ice, and they fished further north than usual. Finding snow crabs was still difficult. 
The lack of sea ice was a red flag for scientists like Aaron Fidua, who was studying the conditions in the Bering Sea that led to the mass die-off. That was an immediate potential smoking gun when we saw this Arctic species suddenly in decline. That's because sea ice is an important ingredient in the snow crab's life cycle. In the winter, it accumulates on the water's surface. And during the summer, the ice melts, sending cold, dense water sinking to the ocean floor, where it hovers just above freezing at around 35 degrees. Scientists call it the cold pool. And it's a sanctuary for young crabs. Warmer temperatures can lead to starvation and higher rates of disease. At the Kodiak Fisheries Research Center, state and federal researchers are piecing together how all those factors contributed to the crab's collapse. Tanks filled with seawater pumped in from the bay replicate conditions on the seafloor. And then we can hold different portions of the same population in, say, 5 degrees Celsius, 8 degrees Celsius. And we can begin to look at the response of those species once they're in these warmer temperatures. Scientists use the pool to study how different temperature and pH levels affect the crab's development, how fast they grow, and how quickly they die. In a separate smaller tank, researchers hook up monitoring equipment to individual crabs and track their breathing in different conditions. They also take blood samples. Uh, we know that increases in temperature increase metabolic rates of fish and crab, causing them to need to eat more and more. In a shrinking cold pool, that means more crabs pushed into a smaller space, fighting for less food. Across the hall from the federal lab, Ben Daly is also trying to figure out how a smaller cold pool affects crabs in the Bering Sea. So that's part of what we're doing now is trying to untangle the what happened part. That's only half of the challenge. The other half of the challenge is what do we do next? Daly and his team have been tagging crabs in the wild with satellite transponders that will track their movement over time. He's hoping the tags provide more detailed information about the distribution of crabs across the cold pool. And this winter, a group of state and federal researchers are heading out on the Silver Spray to continue studying Bering Sea crab populations outside the lab. Gabriel Prout and his family are grateful for the work. The many fishers that rely on snow crabs for income are left with more questions than answers right now. Now we're sitting tight trying to count our pennies and figure out how to make a way forward. Scientists say it will likely take years before the snow crab population rebuilds. If another marine heat wave hits the Bering Sea, it could be even longer. But they're hopeful that lessons learned from snow crabs might provide insight into how other marine species handle climate change as the ocean warms. In Kodiak, I'm Kirsten Dobra. Joining me tonight to discuss what the future of the snow crab fishery may be is Gabriel Prout, the owner of the fishing vessel Silver Spray, featured in the story you just saw, and and Aaron Fedowa, a fisheries biologist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Welcome, both of you. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. So, Gabriel, I, I want to start with you. How is your business faring after such a sudden closure? You're a third generation fisherman in your family, a family business, but as a multi generation business, how difficult is it for you to stay viable? And what do you hear from less well-established vessel owners, people new to this work? Yeah, thank you, Lori. Um, overall, everyone who's in the, the Bering Sea um, uh, crab fleet is, is facing a, a tough time right now. Um, primarily, we, we target the, uh, the Bering Sea tanner crab, the Bering Sea king crab, and the Bering Sea snow crab. Uh, we're just coming off the um, second closure in a row for king crab now for the first time ever, the uh, complete closure of the snow crab um, population out there. So um, all the vessels are, are definitely facing a hard time. Some are a, a little better uh, situated to uh, weather this current storm than others, but overall it's, it's not a good situation. Uh, these vessels are extremely uh, expensive to maintain. You have mortgage fees, you still have insurance fees, and you still have uh, maintenance costs and uh, projects that keep adding up even uh, when sitting at the dock. Uh, so overall, the, the picture for the, the fleet in general is, is looking very bleak uh, right now at this, mm. uh, this point. You mentioned that quotas were increasing before the crash. How well did you do in those lead-up years? And 
And uh, again, the loss of even one season, c could that end it for some of the folks who are fishing or wanting to fish now? Yeah, yeah, another um, good question, Lori. Uh, leading up to the, the collapse, uh, we really were seeing um, uh, an increase in the amount of crab available. The quotas um, uh, set and distributed by the state um, were increasing every year. Uh, so the picture was looking very good. Myself and my brothers um, invested in, in fishing rights to, to catch these crab. Uh, we purchased into the uh, fishing vessel Silver Spray in the summer of 2020, um, right before the, before the collapse. Um, we still obviously have uh, mortgage payments on the, the vessel, on the, the fishing rights and quota that we bought into. Um, so it, it, things were looking good, um, and unfortunately, they they took a turn for the worse. Um, obviously, COVID, the impacts from that, uh, the uh, NOAA summer trawl survey was unable to um, conduct a, a summer survey in the summer of 2021. Um, and that's starting to be very evident. There was a kind of a key piece of information that was uh, just unfortunately missed um, to kind of uh, see maybe the the impacts that were coming up ahead. Um, so it's uh, definitely uh, things were looking good um, and, until they weren't. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, I didn't realize that that vessel was such a recent purchase. So my goodness, Aaron, I want to turn to you now. Tell us about the research that you do through the Eastern Bering Sea Trawl Survey, what you're learning from it, and for folks who aren't familiar, what a research trawl is. Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, Gabriel had actually mentioned a bit about this. Uh, the program I work for here in Kodiak, one of our, our biggest responsibility is a trawl survey that's happened uh, every year since 1975. So it's, it's a critical time series in understanding these highly variable stocks like snow crab that we see that fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, the trawl survey itself, uh, we typically leave, you know, the boats leave from Dutch Harbor every year in mid-May, the survey runs all the way until late August in some years. So as you can tell, it's a massive effort. Uh, there are 375 stations alone in the Eastern Bering Sea. And the, the, the overall goal to be out there is to collect data uh, that's used in our, um, our research and our efforts to manage populations like snow crab. So we're tasked in going out and collecting data on um, both abundance and biomass estimates, how many snow crab there are, but we also collect critical, critical information like um, size compositions, uh, data on disease, other uh, aspects of the population that are important. You started with NOAA in 2018 and said there was, uh, we've talked a little bit about the unusual abundance uh, for snow crab in that year. Tell us about, about that, and is there any information or knowledge about why it may have been such an abundant year? Yeah, great question. Uh, as you said, I started in 2018, and that, that really was a unique year for the bottom trail survey, especially for snow crab. Uh, we saw the, the largest cohort or the largest group of juvenile snow crab we've ever seen in the history of the survey. So the population was looking good. There were a lot of these small snow crab uh, that you know were hopeful in a couple of years that would enter the fishable portion of the population. Um, it, you know, kind of alongside seeing that that large group of juvenile snow crab, 2018 was the start of a heat wave event in the Bering Sea, when we really started to experience these anomalously warm bottom temperatures. Uh, so it was, you know, it was an interesting year, both in terms of seeing a lot of snow crab, but also seeing these uh, really warm bottom temperatures that we don't typically see when we see a lot of snow crab. And then there was a pandemic and research got paused for a bit. In the 2021 survey, you said it was something you'd never seen before. What, what were the findings? Yeah, I was out for two months in 2021 and it was, it was unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, we typically hit uh, up near St. Matthew Island, we tend to hit really high density snow crab stations. 
So the net comes up, there are several thousand snow crab, uh, um, you know, things generally look good. Those are our cold bottom temperatures that we know snow crab need. 2021 really right off the bat was a strange year. Uh, once we started hitting those historically high density stations, the net was virtually coming up empty with snow crab. There were maybe a couple hundred and that trend continued all through the Eastern Bering Sea. So it was very apparent that uh, there was, you know, a population wide stock collapse like we've never seen in 2021. Gabriel, turning back to you, you said of the 60 to 70 vessels that normally fish for snow crab, only 15 to 20 were able to make a go of it. What do you know about any sort of support from the federal government, federal fisheries disaster funds, uh, when they may arrive and if you've heard? And, and are there other options for revenue? Uh, what's possible to help these vessel owners survive and keep making payments? Yeah, so we have gone through the fishery uh, disaster process. Um, Congress has actually already appropriated uh, $300 million in funds for fishery disasters. Uh, we're currently waiting on uh, the NIMPS arm of NOAA to allocate a certain amount for the, the Bering Sea snow crab closure as well as the Bering Sea king crab closure. Um, uh, even now, after the, the funds have already been appropriated, we're still um, waiting for, for the process and applications to open up. And these, these fishery disaster programs, uh, they, they are a multi-year process, unfortunately. So the fishermen that are in dire circumstances right now today, uh, this month, uh, the rest of this year, um, are, are really in a, in, a, in a tough situation to, to be waiting on these funds. Um, uh, my uh, trade organization that I'm a board member on, Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers, is working to uh, try and help speed it up the uh, uh, funding process so that the amount of uh, money allocated from the government gets into the hands of fishermen a little bit quicker. Um, but right now, it's still a very uh, slow and, and unfortunately um, rather broken program where um, we still may be waiting years um, for the money to get into our hands, even after it's been uh, appropriated and funded by, by Congress. And as far as other opportunities for fishing, these, these boats um, that are part of the Bering Sea Crab Fleet are, are specialized to go after uh, the Bering Sea king crab, snow crab, and, and tanner crab populations. So uh, it really is difficult to um, and, and expensive to, to switch over to, to another gear sector or to another fishing sector uh, to try and target a, a different species. So really the, the only option um, with the lack of, of funds right now is to kind of just sit tight and try to keep things um, as up to date as you can. Um, even then you're still cutting maintenance costs, you're, uh, you're cutting crew and you're kind of just sitting at the dock um, trying to, to hope and pray that uh, the snow crab make a comeback or um, you know other fisheries are able to uh, maybe subsidize the, the, the current situation. Perhaps king crab comes back or a larger tanner crab season is, is on the way. So we're really just sitting tight and trying to figure out where we can cut costs. But at this point there's been no payments made yet? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, and the allocation for the funds from Congress was appropriated in December, and of course, uh, government doesn't always move um, as fast as we would like. So, uh, we still are a, a far way off um, from getting hands uh, money into the hands of, of fishermen that, that desperately need it. All right, it's very unfortunate. Aaron, you found that the snow crab. There was some th thought from folks that. They may have been migrating west or north, but you found that they likely died rather than moved. 10 billion of them, a staggering number. What convinced you that it was likely more a mortality than a migration event? That's a great question. And a question that we as scientists asked, you know, first off the bat when those staggering numbers came in, um, you know, 10 billion snow crab, that's, that's an, a huge number. So it's trying to understand, as you would mentioned, if those crab um, moved north, for example, into the Bering Sea, or if they moved west into Russian waters. And what led us to the conclusion of a mortality event is that um, in 2021, we actually conducted a, a survey in the northern Bering Sea as well as the eastern Bering Sea. And we did not note a sizable increase in abundance in snow crab in the northern Bering Sea, which tells us that that stock didn't move north as might have been anticipated. Um, in talking to Russian scientists, they had also noted a decline in catch per unit effort in their 2020 fishery. 
So you might expect, for example, if our snow crab population had moved west into Russian waters, that they would have had great fishing and they would have seen that, you know, that increase in their catch uh, per unit effort. So that, you know, that really led scientists to this hypothesis, given that, that there were such radical changes in the environment that this Arctic species really experienced a large scale mortality event. Density dependent effects, concentrations of these juvenile crabs, smaller amount of cold water, packing them into smaller spaces, less food when they, their metabolism demands that they eat more, not a good situation. How sensitive are these crabs to the temperature changes? As you've been studying them, how much fluctuation in temperature can they take before they really start to falter? Yeah, as I've mentioned, snow crab are an Arctic species. We think of them as really needing uh, this cold body of water that, that scientists call the cold pool, less than two degrees Celsius. The thought based on prior research is that our small juvenile snow crab are, are really most critically um, in need of these cold waters. And that's primarily because this, this cold body of water acts as a refuge from um, predators like Pacific cod that typically tend to avoid those cold bodies of water. So when we bring snow crab into the laboratory, they're able to survive up to warmer temperatures, say eight degrees Celsius. But um, the thinking is that it's this combination of stressors within an environment. So uh, once things start to warm up, as you mentioned, we have suddenly snow crab crammed in smaller spaces. They're fighting for food resources. Um, you potentially have an increase in predation. Things like disease are really important when you have a lot of organisms that are close together. So a, a lot of times it's not an increase in temperature itself, not necessarily a direct effect on the, the physiological capabilities of the organism, but rather a suite of indirect effects that act as um, multiple stressors to negatively influence snow crab populations. You said a goal is to be able to forecast when a warming event may happen again, but how difficult is that to make a prediction like that? Great question. Um, very difficult. So we have, as scientists, we have climate models that can, that can attempt to predict these conditions that we might see in the future. Um, the problem is that the snow crab population in our 45-year survey time series is highly variable. It's, it's very difficult to predict. As uh, Gabriel had said, uh, you know, things were looking really good in 2018, 2019. Uh, they were catching a lot of crab in the fishery. So I think it goes to show that uh, the need to uh, not only be able to predict these future heat wave events, but begin to understand how, how they influence snow crab directly, especially at specific life history stages, I think will be critical in uh, potentially being able to forecast these events in the future. All right, thank you, Erin. Gabriel, I want to turn back to you. What do you want to see from industry and government to try to help resolve the health of the crab fishery? And, and what do you think can be done? Yeah, uh, thank you, Lori. Um, I think, honestly, just having a, a rapid financial relief program, uh, much like farmers get during times of, of crop failure or wind storms or, or health storms, um, be implemented for uh, not just obviously burying sea fishermen, but fisheries across the country. Uh, we really are in need of a, a rapid financial relief program that works uh, for the fishermen. Um, right now, waiting on, on funds for bills that are due today, uh, waiting for that money to come in in a year or two really isn't going to um, isn't going to cut it. Uh, right now, we uh, are in, uh, you know, we have mortgage payments, we have fishing rights that uh, still have the loans due on them. Um, so having some type of rapid financial relief program and, and speeding up the disaster process so that it works um, and you can get funding out on a, a much quicker basis um, would be would be an excellent help uh, to, to, to fishermen right now, not only in Alaska, but but across the country and, you know, the, the, the Kuskokwim River salmon are, are, are also um, uh, not as, as bountiful. They're, they're suffering um, uh, certain certain issues up there as well. There's California that's having a, a salmon closure as well. And there's going to be fishermen that are facing similar issues, not just in Alaska, but across the country. So having a rapid financial uh, relief program for situations like these for fishery disasters would be uh, extremely helpful to get that money in a matter of months instead of years. 
Your vessel is, I assume, tied up at the dock right now, not what you want. Uh, when do you think you'll have it back out on the water making money again? So we were very fortunate actually to um, uh, get a little bit of funding for some uh, urgent research in the Bering Sea. Um, uh, NOAA and ADFG, um, uh, as well as the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation, was able to, to pull money together uh, to get a couple of the vessels uh, back to work and, and start investigating some of the um, situation and water temperatures and um, uh, health of crab stocks out there. Uh, it was primarily focused on the, the Bering Sea, uh, the iconic red king crab. Uh, we did a lot of research there for the, the past month in uh, the middle of March and towards the uh, um, a couple first weeks of April here. Um, so it's uh, there, are, there are opportunities coming, and, and with that as well, the, the fishery disaster process will be funding research projects like that. Okay. So as soon as that right. process comes up, it would be excellent. Yeah, I hope that comes through. Thank you so much. We'll have to leave it there. I appreciate your time tonight. The collapse in the snow crab population mirrors decline seen in some of Alaska's iconic salmon runs in recent years. As you heard this evening, there is a lot of research being done to try to better understand the factors affecting marine species and although there is still much to learn, the warming caused by climate change is one clear culprit, creating problems for the creatures that live below the water's surface and depend on a stable habitat to, to thrive. That's it for this edition of Alaska Insight. Visit our website, alaskapublic.org, for breaking news and reports from our partner stations across the state. While you're there, sign up for our free daily digest so you won't miss any of Alaska's top stories of the day. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night.